All right. Well, we're so excited to have you here. I'm Linda Battles. I'm the regional vice president at Western Governors University, and I'm so honored to moderate this great panel uh, where we're going to be discussing uh, navigating uh, in, a, in, in a new era of higher education facts about the future. And we say the future, but we really mean now, because the reality is we're living in it now. So I'm really excited to uh, have our distinguished panel of experts who will share their insights and their experience in navigating this new era. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Philly Mantella, who is the fifth president and the first female president of Grand Valley State University. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Grand Valley is the third largest public university in Michigan, and when she was appointed as president in 2019, since then she has really expanded uh, the university's offerings and programs that are directly aimed at non-traditional students and underrepresented students. So thank you for your leadership there, Dr. Mantilla. And we'll, we'll say Philly. <laughs> And then um, our next panelist is someone who has one of the most uh, recognizable voices in higher education, uh, Dr. Joe Salusio. And if I had his sound effects right now, I'd be saying he's amazing. <laughs> uh, he is the co-author of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education. He is also the co-founder and host of the EdUp Experience podcast, which recently surpassed 700 episodes in just four years. That's incredible. <laughs> Uh, Joe also serves as the Senior Vice President at Lindenwood uh, Global University. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Kate Colbert, who is the other author of Commencement and is an accomplished marketer, speaker, and communications consultant who has led marketing initiatives uh, for brands big and small uh, here dom domestically and internationally. So welcome, Kate. Thank you. So Kate and Joe's book, uh, Commencement, is really the foundation for our discussion today. And it's been heralded by, heralded by Forbes uh, as the indispensable touch point for what's being said in, about, and around higher education. So that's very exciting. Um, I want to say First of all, I wanted to mention that when you walked in, that you will see a QR code at that back table over there. Be sure that you scan that code because we are going to be giving five books away in a raffle uh, to five lucky win winners. And we will announce the winners after the panel discussion. Also want to make a quick plug um, for the WGU uh, newsletter. If you can sign up for that there, you have a QR code at your, at your seats. And then also encourage all of you to stay right in here for a reception that WGU is, is going to be hosting right after this session. And we're going to be playing trivia, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But we'll, we'll get the things, things started right now. Um, let me just mention a few things about commencement. It, it features uh, the insights of over 100 college and university presidents, including WGU president Scott Pulsifer and Dr. Mantella. Uh, and these are our presidents of institutions that are challenging the status quo, that are disrupting higher education. So we are so excited to talk about some of the three emerging themes that came out of commencement. Uh, the first, we're going to be talking about leading in a new era of higher education. What does that leadership look like? Not only for uh, the presidents, but also for faculty. And we're going to be talking about embracing innovation and technology. And then finally, nurturing a student-centric and inclusive culture. So at the end of our discussion, we're going to go ahead and open it up to Q&A. So start thinking about your questions. And then we'll have a mic right here on the floor that you can go up to. All right, well, let's get started. Let's start with leading in a new era of higher education. Uh, what does that leadership look like? And Joe, I'm going to start with you because you've had the extraordinary experience of being able to interview hundreds 
of presidents. You have a really good idea of what that looks like. Uh, so tell us, what does an effective leader of higher education look like today? Uh, th thank you for that question. First, I, I just want to say that um, for any of you that did not know about the happy hour, we're going to assume that everybody came here for the session and not the happy hour. <laughs> so later when we come up and ask you, you're going to say that you came here for the session, even though it's okay to lie to us in that case. Um, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's changing, right? It's a changing landscape. Um, I've interviewed uh, Elvin, co-founder of the Oedip Experience, right here in the front row, 270 college and university presidents over the last four years. And from, from everywhere, right? From small schools, big schools, public schools, private schools, um, religiously affili affiliated schools, tribal colleges, uh, community colleges, everywhere. And the one piece about leadership that I've seen a shift in, and you've seen it, you've seen it too, look at a job ad for a president right now. Look at the job ad. Janet Sprague's over here from Forsyth Tech. Look at, look at a job ad. And back in the day, it would lead with, academic, academic expertise, you need to have deep academic experience, so on and so forth. Now, it'll lead with something like, we'd like this candidate to have deep financial acumen. We'd like you to understand marketing and enrollment trends and what's happening in the space of higher education. Why? Because schools are closing. There, I mean, how many of you guys see like every day? What amazes me about the closures is the ones that find out that they're running like a $100 million deficit. It's like yesterday we found out that we're $30 million in the hole. <laughs> and you just go, who is looking at this? Um, but it's happening, right? It happens to big flagships that go, we have a $230 million deficit. Oops, what are we going to do now? We're going to cut everybody's jobs, right? That's typically what happens if you're not managing it. So that financial acumen, the awareness, a uh, piece is really, really critical. You have to know what what's what trends are happening out there right now. You know, where marketing is a big deal in higher ed. You gotta market. We have a customer. You may not agree with the terminology, but it, the student is a customer. They get to choose what school they want to go to. And now there's no geography. You can choose my institution. You can choose WGU, Grand Valley State. We all have online. We have it differently, but the student gets to choose their own adventure. So I think that's for me. What, what that trend, it's a flipped trend. It's that, that budget management piece. As a president, do you want to be doing that all the time? No, you want to be serving students. But if your budget is healthy, if your enrollment is healthy, you get to serve more students. So it's this great, nice cycle we have. That cycle is broken when you don't understand the budget, when your expenses exceed revenue. I come from the, I know I'm running out of time, but I come from the for-profit sector of higher ed. I spent 15 years. We never ran with a deficit. If you ran with a deficit, they would stand you up and say, see ya, you're out, right? In, in nonprofit higher ed, somehow we run with deficits. That's something I have to get my head around and, and all of us should. Thank you, Joe, that's exactly right. Great insights. And I know, Kate, uh, you did some research as you were writing commencement and did a survey of higher education professionals on this very topic. Can you share a little bit of what your findings were? Yeah, so, so Joe talking about financial acumen was actually um, one of the top pieces of information we found. So, so our work was very research-based in that it was based on the insights of 125 college and university presidents. But we also did a survey of higher education professionals at all levels and all functional areas, and it was anonymous. And doing the research anonymously allows a little bit more truth-telling. Um, so we had people tell us some really interesting things and we found out some really interesting statistics. And one of the things we asked was, if you could write a job description for a higher education leader, what would the job requirements look like? And so in terms of hard skills, financial acumen was the number one, which Joe just talked about. Um, but when we asked about what else? It was things like expertise in brand and marketing. It was things like um, ability to lead teams. Um, it was open-mindedness to new structures and operating models. Um, that was huge. So when we asked people if you could choose just one trait, one personality trait, that open-mindedness, particularly to new operating models and structures, was number one. And you know, for the longest time, we've been making a huge mistake in higher education, and I say this all the time, the biggest mistake we can make in higher education is continually choosing to operate for the era in which we were founded 
and not the era in which we currently exist. So we've all got sweatshirts, right, from our alma maters or where we work now or where we used to work, and it says inevitably something like, founded in 1847, right? It's always 1847. Um, <laughs> and, right, right? But what happens when we keep doing things the way we've always done them? Um, we end up in a situation where we are asking students to settle in 2024 and beyond for 1847 policies, 1847 curriculum, 1847 ways of treating our customers more like children and we tell them how to do things. But that's not how anyone wants to operate in anymore. And so our survey data showed us that it showed us a really tricky thing, right? So we know that a lot of people make their way to the president's office through a traditional path. And Joe and I saw this, and, and you see this a lot. Um, you know, folks will start out as a faculty member, and they become a department chair, and maybe they become a provost, and they become a VP of something, and eventually they become a president, right? That sort of, or a dean somewhere along the way. They become this sort of academic path, right? But we're seeing more and more people coming into higher education from outside of higher education. You know, Joe, Joe works for a president who came in from IBM. Right, um, and so so that open-mindedness to new operating structures um, and models uh, sometimes comes from outside. The challenge is we also heard that people want their leaders to have 15 plus years of experience in higher ed, and so the trick is we want our leaders in higher ed to have insider experience to sort of understand how things work in higher ed, but we want them to have outsider mindsets, and that's a challenge. Yeah. Love that, love that, totally agree. Billy? So I guess I'm the sitting president up here and should speak a little bit about my experience, which was a non-traditional path. So um, I started in the student service side and then enrollment development, and I did my PhD in business affairs, and I was, all of a sudden I became very intentional around wanting to understand the institution in total that I, I didn't want to come up a vertical, I wanted to come up horizontally. And in fact, my last stop was Northeastern University before I took this presidency, where we spun off a separate 501c3 for the purpose of innovation, which was so much fun because it was total greenfield opportunity to build up global campuses. And so um, that brings me to kind of the competency. I think we've got to stop thinking vertically. I think we've got to think about the organizational enterprise. I can't tell you how many times that I challenge on a daily basis leadership who believes we lead by prerogative. You know, I'm the academic affairs lead, so therefore I am the voice of. Now the beauty of understanding if you put a programmatic problem issue in the middle of a room and someone feels free to say, you know, the market orientation of this may suggest, the financial orientation may suggest. So there's really opportunity, I think, for us to think about the horizontal as well as the verticals we come from and really the richness it brings to break down these silos that are actually keeping us in the founded era, to use your words. Um, and, and help us to really look and move forward. I, I came in, in in my presidency in July 2019. You know, I did the, you know, how many, how many listening sessions can you do in six months, you know, kind of start, and then all of a sudden you're in a pandemic, right? So one of the things that I have struggled with and enjoyed, um, and I, I totally, you know, like I'm totally a geek around complexity, so I really enjoy when it gets hard. Um, but uh, one of the things I've really enjoyed is really thinking about how you can both lead in the present, think about the future. We have a lot of visionaries, but the key, I think, is the line of sight between the two. Like, how do you really draw the way in which you're going to reach for that future? And how does the pandemic keep you from living totally in the present and allow you to continue to plan and execute on a future vision? So just a few thoughts. Love that. Thank you, Philly. And great insights from our president here on the panel. Uh, so let's go on to the next theme, which is innovation and technology. Um, as you all know, most of you may know in this room that Western Governors University was built on innovation and technology, uh, and, 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 and we've grown ever since. 
So I'd like to start with, um, with Joe. Uh, can you tell us what your thoughts are in terms of how can higher education institutions embrace innovation and technology to better serve evolving the needs of our students and, and the workforce? Sure. Um, I do want to say just fortuitously that Philly Mantella was the first female president that we interviewed on the podcast and the Oedipus Experience podcast in 2020 when we first started. It was the boots. <laughs> Saw the boots in a picture. I was like, we got to get her on the podcast. Trendsetter. Uh, for anybody that hasn't um, listened to the podcast, it's called the Oedipus Experience. We've interviewed ed tech CEOs, you know, technology innovation companies everywhere. Um, here, here's the bit about higher ed that's really interesting. It t technology sounds really easy, and then you put it into the, the structure of higher education, and sometimes it's really hard to do. Think about... Um, for anybody that works in a higher ed institution, if you have a standard term program, right? Like the fall, spring, fall, spring, summer, so on. Knock it off its track, right? Go to non-standard term or non-term programs. See what happens internally. Um, and I say this from experience because I have just done that. Um, it, was, it took a lot of, uh, I'm not even sure if the trust is still there, but it took a lot of, um, uh, um, I don't know the right word, convincing um, to the point where, you know, the, the, the thing about higher ed that we have to avoid, all of us, is the assimilation culture, right? It, it, the culture exists. You ever heard culture eats strategy for breakfast? N never has it been more true than in an industry like higher ed because the, the, the culture is adverse to change. So when you try to put in some kind of innovation, it says, nope, you can't do that, right? And you know that when somebody come up, comes up to you and goes, accreditation. Accreditation. You cannot do that. Accreditation says so. Yeah, we all know that's a bunch of BS because accreditation says you can do whatever the heck you want. Why do I know this? Because I've interviewed, what, four of the six or seven accrediting presidents and they say, do whatever the heck you want. Just assess it. But if you say you're going to do it, you better do it, right? That's the truth. You can do whatever you want. But take a standard term program, knock it off its term. What you do is you start to see all the technology that comes into something like that because you have to build out your LMS differently. You have to build your structural design has to be different. Your SIS has to pull data differently. The whole thing has to be reimagined. Forget the technology you can bring in. Just knock something off the track that you already have. And you're going to find out how good your technology and innovation mindset really is. My guess is it's not as good as you want it to be. Um, you have people in your institution that push and push and push and push. And I actually was at a conference last well, two weeks ago, and somebody said, "What advice do you have for innovators in higher ed who are trying to do these things?" And I said, "You got to keep pushing. You got to keep fighting because it's going to swallow you whole if you don't." Right. So that's what I would say. Forget what you can bring in from the outside. Knock something off. Mess up something you already have and rebuild it. That is so true. And the semester credit hour system. <laughs> is, I knew I'd get you going. <laughs> is is an obstacle, but uh, I turn it over to Philly on this question as well. Interested to hear. Yeah, it, it's so true. Accreditation, it comes up. Uh, you know, they point at you and say accreditation, or quality, quality yes. assurance, quality assurance. You can only assure quality through tenure. Think about that for a moment. That is a really good way to assure quality and knowledge in a discipline, not so much in teaching, not so much in being able to move and pivot and motivate. And so we just introduced a model at Grand Valley this past week called GVSU Omni, which is really focused on adult learners and using our regional campuses. And a lot of pushback around not utilizing uh, the traditional faculty models. And really, I could, I could delineate all of the QA that can be done through this model and say, this model's great. OK, this has QA. It's great. I appreciate it. But look at this. So not buying into that is just so important, Joe, and I, I really appreciate you, say, appreciate you saying that. One of the things that I have thought a lot about is the way we don't support innovation in our institution structurally. We talk about innovation as culture. I totally get it. 
It is so true. I mean, one of the things I try to do is when we find innovators, they get innovation funding, is get them in community so they're not lone rangers, isolated, unsupported, working against the clock because they have all the same duties as they always had while they're trying to innovate. Culture is really important. But when I came in, one of the things I did with my board is I said innovations like deferred maintenance. We should always have a fund in our budget and it should be refreshed each and every year. And we immediately put $10 million aside and that innovation fund gets, you know, fueled, repaid. We make some mistakes, we lose some money, but it should always be in place structurally just like defer deferred maintenance is on our college campuses. And I think we've got to really, really think about that. The last thing I would say um, is we've got to figure out some new frameworks to work in market time, not in academic time. So a couple of initiatives that we launched um, at Grand Valley were focused on getting corporate support to allow us to go faster. So we did a Corwell Health Scholars Program. Corwell Health is actually the largest employer in Michigan. It's the berger of two hospital systems. And um, of course, nurses, we were in great demand, just like everywhere in the country. And we said, um, look, you're paying a premium for traveling nurses. You're paying fine nurse fee. They're coming and not staying. You invest in Grand Valley, and we will immediately raise 500 more nurses, do 500 more nurses in our program. But accreditation. <laughs> there are a lot of rules around nursing. In particular, we needed infrastructure dollars in order to do that. If they supported us for five years, it gives me the time to pivot faculty towards high demand fields, right? Because you can't just do that overnight. So I think we've got to keep thinking about market time and how do we break it. I think we've got to think about culture, but I also think structurally we've got to think about how does innovation get to be a part of our work. Kate. So as I'm listening to Philly talk about structure, it occurs to me, so I get asked a lot about what's the difference between a college that's going to thrive and one that's going to close. So with a lot of closures happening, um, it's something that Joe and I get asked a lot about um, on media interviews. Um, and you talking about structure really reminds me of, of some really sad stories that I've seen happen recently. I worked at an MBA school and we had um, a sort of a VP level person who was in charge of um, innovation and design at that institution. Um, and when things got tough, they eliminated that position instead of pushing, as Joe said, instead of pushing forward for innovation, right? Um, when we surveyed people uh, for our book, um, we got some really, um, sad stories and shocking stories and exciting stories. And, and one of them was from an IT professional um, who was responsible for taking good care of the students um, when everyone um, who was sort of on ground went to, you know, not pedagogically designed online learning, but, but um, sort of emergency response online learning. And, and his institution had to start offering learning um, from a distance. And as soon as they reopened their campus, his position was eliminated because they told him online learning was no longer necessary. And I wanted to cry when I read that. Um, and so there are, are a lot of laundry lists I could make you of here are some things to be concerned about um, in terms of college closures, right? You know, your endowments less than, you know, 50 million. Your yield rates less than 20%, et cetera, right? Um, year over year enrollment declines. There's a million things. But take a look at, to Philly's point, um, are, is this institution purpose-built to change? Is it purpose-built to innovate? Are there people in charge of that? Have those positions been eliminated? Um, and I think that there's a lot that you can see from that, you know, and then take a look at, um, you know, are they investing in innovation? Have they just put $10 million aside for something? Um, is it a place like Western Governors University that has WGU Labs? You know, yesterday I heard somebody from, from WGU Labs say, you know, we essentially run as our own organization, right? Where they are purposefully investigating new types of academic policies, new types of delivery methods, new structures. Um, that's where we need to be going. And so, yeah, I think right now, I think it's really important that whatever kind of institution you work at, that you be um, continually looking at technology adoption, not technology for the sake of technology, but what do your students want? If they're saying to you, here's how I want to learn, what I want to learn, where I want to learn, when I want to learn it, 
are you delivering on that promise? And if not, is technology something you can be putting to better use to be able to do that? Um, and I think that um, part of innovation, because we don't think of all the time students as customers, learners as customers in higher ed, a huge part of innovating in higher ed right now is adopting retail mindsets. And the institutions that have done it well are going to eat the rest of us for lunch. <laughs> That's a really good point. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think about that all the time at WGU, and I compare my experience at a traditional institution versus what our students at WGU go through. And I actually just finished doing a survey, uh, an analyzing a survey where our students were asked about enrollment processes, scholarship application processes, and credit transfer processes. And overwhelmingly, our students are satisfied. And I think once you have a, a satisfied student, that helps them make the decision to continue to persist and complete at the institution. So it, it does make a, an impact on the students' perceptions and experiences. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing. We're going to get on to our next theme, which Wait is... Wait one second. Yes. I can, can I get a <laughs> shout out to Linda, who just submitted her five chapter <laughs> dissertation for review. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you. <laughs> soon will not be the future Dr. Linda Battle. She'll be Dr. 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 Linda Battle. Uh, yes, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, well, I, I, I want to get to the third theme uh, from commencement, and it's, it's actually my favorite theme, which is um, creating a student-centered culture and creating that culture of um, for students' sense of belonging and inclusion. So who wants to start off first? I'm going to throw it out to you all. Who wants to start? J Joe says <laughs> I need to start. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleague, <laughs> Philly Mantel. We were kidding around how every time we didn't want to start, we were going to just be thrown it. So um, yeah, this is my favorite part, too. I mean, I think coming out of uh, um, the student affairs domain and then into more broader leadership, uh, we understand the power of student voice really, really uh, incredible. And so, you know, I tell you stories about Grand Valley and what we're working on, not to say we're doing it all right, please understand me. I say it with great humility that, you know, we're working on some things. But uh, to make it concrete, you know, and, and hopefully to help um, think through how, how you get to, to, to frame some of this where students can really be fully in their power. So I don't agree with student-centered. I think student-centered is the wrong language. Like we all circle around and, and then we say, you're in the center, but you have to go down our path, our way. Like I don't get it. Like uh, every institution uses that phraseology. Um, I like to think about um, students as being architects to their own education and that we truly can flex the curriculum and support around what they um, how they're thinking about their mission, their purpose, uh, their pathway, and how it evolves over time. So one of the one of the um, pieces of work I've done with some wonderful colleagues, and you know, it's easy to get isolated as an innovator in education too. And so uh, there's a group we call it Rep Four, um, and it's about rapid educational prototyping. You remember I said, how do you do education more quickly? Um, and what we do is we ask students, and, and underserved students, the students that need our educational assets, to come and architect educational change at our institutions. And then we commit to putting some of those changes in place. To me, that's really given students their full power. And let me tell you, some of the things they have created are just amazing. I'll give you one example. Um, not surprising, one of the areas they were very focused on is financial literacy. How do they possibly understand you know, paying for college over time? All, many, many, many students were living at poverty levels, uh, first-gen students. And what they created in XR uh, was really a whole sort of way to think about your money personality with animals that they became, you know, you, you picture animal, octopus, shopper, squirrel, <laughs> saver. Um, and then through tarot cards, they went on a journey to get from their personality to a more well-rounded person. Well, there is no freaking way I would have ever thought to do that. And it became so relatable to students. And 
The other thing I'll say about really empowering students' voice is I have a faculty that care deeply about students, and I think many of our faculty do. And um, the students have a more powerful voice than I do. So when they stand up and say, you know, this is really important to me, it is far more impactful. So another good reason for putting them more in the center. Have you guys seen the Netflix special Super Pumped? Anybody seen it? Not one single person in here. <laughs> it is about Uber. It's the story of Uber. And it's super pumped because the guy, Travis Kalanick from Uber, that's, he would say to his staff, get pumped. Everybody's got to get pumped. And, it, and it, it's, you should watch it because it talks about a frictionless experience. And that's what Uber was trying to create. Frictionless, right? You pull out your phone. You put your credit card in one time. Pull out your phone. Magically, a car pulls you pulls up, picks you up, drives to, drives you where you want to go. You get out. You don't even need to tip. You don't have to do a single thing except open a door and shut a door. And everything was designed with Uber. You should watch this. I can't believe not one single. It makes me feel very <laughs> inadequate. Like I'm watching the wrong. We're stuff. such a disappointment. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's the first crowd ever where nobody raised their hand. And it's only been out for like a month. Anyway, please, somebody watch it. Uh, but it talks about frictionless, right? And I, there's somebody, there's a gentleman in this room who slipped in. He said he was going to be here, and he came late. That's Wally Boston over there in the corner. Wally's a former president of American Public University System. And they went from, I don't know, a couple thousand when he started to 90,000 when he finished. And you want to talk about what it takes to create a, a student experience during that time. You've got to talk to people that have done it. Right? That's the other piece of advice. You have to talk to people that are doing that work. What does student-centered mean? I like what you're saying, right? Student-centered. I, I, I like being, you know, the student is an architect. You have, to, you have to build things for the student. They define the experience, right? So that's my role, chief experience officer at Lindenwood University. And we have both on-ground, about 4,000 on-ground students, residential, and we have about 3,000 online. And I tell this story because it is the ex it's the example of it. We went through a meeting, and we spoke for about 50 minutes about food service and dorms and you know one-stop shops for our students to come in and get support, so on and so on. And the guy that works for me that does online recruitment goes, hey, I know we spent 50 minutes talking about residential students, but do you want to talk about the 3,000 online students? Like literally all of us, all the executives are sitting in the room. It's just the way the institution was engineered. You can't serve adult students if you don't talk about them. You can't serve the online student if you don't make them a priority. But your institution did something. Either they were residential to start and you've extended to the adult learner, or they were adult learner first, and maybe that's where your bread and butter is, and you don't have to talk about a residential. But if you're in that balance, Student-centered means different things, or, or the architect means different things to different students at different times. The underpinning is frictionless, if you can make it that way. Sorry, Kate. I was all prepared to talk about frictionless, and then look at that, my co-author steals my answer. I don't prepare for these. He steals my answer. No, it's all right. I have plenty to say. If you've picked up a copy of the book, you know that. Um, so it's 500 pages long. Um, so, you know... So yeah, heck yeah, <laughs> it's worth every page. I promise you. Um, no, it's in, but that frictionless experience is really about how do we make things easier. So I worked at a medical university, uh, medical sciences institution, um, as the head of marketing, and I had one of those um, Office Max Staples easy buttons. Like I don't know if any of you have the red button. You can, you hit the button and it says that was easy. Um, I was actually going to bring it as a prop, and I dropped it yesterday and broke it. Um, and, but I had it in my office, and we always, you know, we worked at, at a very political, very bureaucratic institution. You probably could relate. And um, I used to have tell my staff, you know, you come into my office. If we figure out, we can fix something for the students, for ourselves. We can solve for something and make a decision easily without having to create a committee. Um, you know, like, let's celebrate that. And so they'd come into my office, and they'd hit the easy button. You know, that's how we would celebrate. And... Um, but we need to be looking at that. Like, if your institution, if you haven't recently secret shopped your own campus tour, if you haven't filled out your own application online, if you haven't 
tried to register for a class, if you haven't tried to reach a professor um, to talk to them about something important or schedule an appointment, um, be looking at those processes. Um, you know, a, a lot of people talk about, because it, it came up in the book, um, I, I got very sick when I was an undergrad and I needed to take a medical leave of absence and my undergraduate institution would not let me. Um, and so even though I was straight A student, if I needed to step out to have surgery, um, I was going to have to repay for all those courses, even though I was willing to take them again and do the work again. And, um, and my family couldn't afford that. And so I, I stayed sick for seven more weeks. Um, and there was, because there was no leave of absence policy, right? Um, and we can do better. Um, we can do better. We, you know, yesterday's policies again. 1847 policies are not cutting it, and I think student-centric. I agree, it's sort of the wrong word. I first of all like the word learner. Um, you know, when if I'm talking about somebody who's 50 years old, um, who is is working on whether it's a certificate or a degree, they're coming for some sort of corporate education. They might not think of themselves as a student. They, that might be feel very backpacky or 18 year old or whatever to them. But um, so I, I like the the word learner. Um, but but our imperative in higher education is a people imperative, um, and it really is about um, you know if if you have, are guilty of this, I would love for you to resolve with me to never say this again. I remember saying many times in my career when I was looking at job candidates, whether or not they had a degree and like, well, but their degree's not in what I need them to do, but they have got the skills or the habits or the attitudes or the competencies that I need. And, but the degree says something. It says that they were able to like make a big goal, stick to it and, and, and finish it. But what I was really saying is that they were able to jump through all these ridiculous hoops higher education asked them to jump through. And I think we need to stop being proud of ourselves and patting ourselves on the back for making it difficult. Going to college is difficult already. The learning is difficult. The studying is difficult. The proving your competencies in a new skill is difficult. All the rest of it should be easy. Right? The rest of it should be easy. So I'm going to quote something that um, I heard in an interview after we um, wrote the book. So this interview is not, uh, not in the book. But Joe interviewed Monty Randall, um, who is the president of College of the Mus Muskogee Nation. And he said something that I quote all the time. And he said, access without support is not opportunity. Access without support is not opportunity. And think about that. If we let you in and say, welcome, but you can't figure out how to make it work. It doesn't fit your life. It doesn't fit your career. They don't have a daycare center for your kids to attend. The, you know, the bursar isn't available 24-7 when you're available. What's um, a bursar? What's a bursar, um, right? Yeah, exactly. We, they don't explain to you what the hell a bursar is, right? <laughs> right? If we don't make it work, it doesn't matter that we let you in. Access without support is not opportunity. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if I owned a college, my tagline would be outcomes for everyone. Um, I want to be able to figure out how to serve anybody who wants to learn something after high school. And I want to figure out how to deliver on them, to, to them, measurable outcomes in their career and in their life. And that, for me, is my hope for the future of higher education. Awesome. Great insights here. I'm so excited to, to now open this up to the, the audience for Q&A. So please jump up to the mic if you have any questions. Somebody rounding. Is he rounding? <laughs> he's rounding to the mic. Everybody watch him round. Round. To the mic. Oh, and then he's cut off at the pass. <laughs> Somebody got in front of him. Go ahead. Okay. So first, thank you for everything. I would like to know your opinion about the roles of, role of ed techs in the future of universities. You talked about innovation, but and the role of ed techs and what can be outsourced and what can't be outsourced from a university. I think Philly Mantel is the best one to answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, told you I, was uh, yeah, do it. I know. Um, I, I think the ed techs have an incredibly important role. I think that um, the competencies that can be brought through an outsourced model, um, I think it's just the discernment. Too many people in education have a civil, silver bullet mentality about the ed techs. And so they just immediately go, oh, well, okay. And we really have to be thoughtful about what is it we need, why do we need it, how is their model aligning to our needs? Is it appropriate for our institution? 
Um, is it fiscally responsible? So for me, you know, when, when I'm thinking about outsourcing, I try to do the work up front uh, around the needs rather than to what, what uh, I'm sure there's exhibitors here, no disrespect to anyone, but it's very easy to walk through an exhibit hall and just be taken by all of the various things that are there, the opportunities, and not be intentional about where is your weakness, where do you need support, um, why, what do you want to leverage? So I really appreciate the question. I think it's an important one. I think there's work we've got to do. I, I'd add one quick bit. AI companies now are in the edge, right? So everything, have you seen TurboLearn.ai? <laughs> if you have not checked out TurboLearn for students, right, it takes, it takes, I put my dissertation in there. My dissertation is, is, is pretty good, I have to admit. But, <laughs> uh, but you stick it in there and it literally sectioned it off, put it in its sections, called out my methodology, did all of that, made 200 flashcards and 100 quiz questions within like three minutes. And I thought, wow, if I was a student, Linda and I were just talking about this, like illicit, illicit AI where you can just put in what topic you want and it gives you all the research that you ever wanted. Boy, it'd be nice to start a doctorate over and have all those tools. So bright, shiny toys, right? So that's, I think, what we have to decide is what, what can stand the test of time because what's going to happen to the ed techs like, the sector itself as they eat each other. You know, the AI companies will eat each other. Um, and so I think a lot of us in higher ed are waiting to see what happens as AI now starts to take over. Um, what do you invest in that stands that test of time? Or is that company going to turn into something else um, before you know it? And I think that's where the caution, a little bit of word of caution from those that are buying those tools. And it comes back to the people imperative, right? So Philly is saying, you know, like, what's the problem? What is the problem you are trying to solve at your institution? And actually before that, what is the problem your students have? Or what is the need that they have? Or what is the desire that they have that you're not fulfilling um, as well as you could? And then how do we take that to really smart people at companies like ed tech companies and say, we would like to make this very sort of friction full um, experience, frictionless. And do you have a technology solution for that? And if so, we, we'd like to take a look at that. And um, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's not technology for technology's sake. I'm a marketer by trade, and I can't tell you how many, every time something new comes out, you know, I remember when uh, mobile apps, right? Everybody got their iPhones, and, and, and people would say, we need to build an app. All my clients would, we need to build an app. And I would say, what, what are you going to do with it? I don't know, but we have to have an app. I'm like, what will it do for your customer? Right? Like you don't need an app if you don't have a problem to solve or an opportunity um, that you can blow something wide open to serve your customers. So it really does. And, and by the way, you know, we love ed tech companies. I mean, between the three of us, oh my gosh, we're like always at an ed tech conference, right? And they're doing amazing things. And again, it comes back to the people imperative. So look at the people in your admissions department or your financial department or whatever and ask, you know, sort of back to the AI, like how do we make jobs easier? So if you're an institution and you don't have a whole lot of people um, and you're trying to serve your students, if there's a technology solution that can make things better for your students and it can keep your employees from having to work seven days a week and miss their daughter's piano recital, um, we should be looking at that. Next question. Hey, thanks for doing this panel. I'm tall, so this is like awkward for me. Um, my name is Matt Radcliffe. I'm the executive director of marketing and communication for Pikes Peak State College in Colorado. Uh, there's a new book out called Whatever It Is, I'm Against It. Brian Resistance. Rosenberg. Yeah. And one of the things he posits in that book is that faculty identify more with their discipline than they do as members of the institution. Uh, of course, nobody in this room. Don't, don't, yeah towards me. Um, so my question is, um, at the institutional level, we need to innovate, but we also have this shared governance model that requires us to have buy-in to that change. Can you share some stories of successful uh, innovation, successful building up of coalitions and acceptance of the change that needs to happen? Oh, I have a story. By the way, I was reading Brian's book on the plane yesterday. So, uh, great book. And by the way, you know, I love his candor. So, you know, the, whatever I'm, it is, I'm against it. He was the pre previous president at McAllister um, College. And, and I started out as a faculty member. So, you know, I know I, I showed up every day caring about what I taught about and not really focused on the business of the institution. And I think it's hard um, to get faculty who are 
deep experts in their vertical, right? They're functional experts in a particular topic or um, to get them to understand the working, but we can do that. Like really great leaders can teach everyone at their institution how the institution works. Um, it, you know, how to, so this open, we talked about open-mindedness to new operating structures. My favorite story is, is Dr. Um, uh, Malik uh, Corey at what well, used to be called Unity College in Maine and is now Unity Environmental University. Um, and 10 years ago, they had fewer than 500 students. They now have 7,500 and are on track to have 10,000 in the next year or so. Um, and they did that by innovating with technology and thinking about how to put students first. But they first blew up their operating model and service of the students. And so they totally changed their governance model. They took a look at it and said, we cannot run this business um, with these sustainable sort of units, a, a, an online unit, an on-ground unit, an ancillary revenues unit. How do we do this if we don't even have them broken into units? How do we do this if the faculty senate has more power than the president's cabinet and none of them are really talking to each other, right? Um, I remember being in, in a role like yours and the worst thing you could ever tell me was, Kate, we'd like you to give a presentation to the faculty senate. Like, I would have to go vomit first because I was terrified. Like, they're the scariest people on campus, and right? Because it was going to be no, they are like the committee of no. Um, and it didn't matter how cool it was, whatever I was bringing to them, the answer was no or eye roll or whatever, it was terrifying. Um, and I think that I think that we have to go back, yes, the faculty are the heart and soul of the institution, right? You are teaching, you are giving the students the cash, I like to call it cash value with a K, right? Knowledge, attitudes, skills, habits. You're imparting that and giving a safe practice field for the students to learn and practice those things. And yet, you're doing it within the structure of an organization. And it has to work the way that we promised the students that it will work. And you can't just do your own thing, and you can't just use your syllabus from 1974, not 1874, because you'd be dead. But but you're, we have people who are using their syllabus from 1984 or 1994. Um, and so how do we think about that? And listen, th it was not easy at Unity. Um, you know, the faculty sued. You know, somebody took spray paint and spray painted F-U-C-K Malik outside the president's office, okay? But they knew that they had to have a different kind of board, a different kind of governance structure internally, a different kind of faculty handbook, um, and they did that. And they went in the last decade from fewer than 500 students to 7,500 students and making news all over the place. And so I, I do think structure is everything. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think faculty mean to be a roadblock. I think that we hired people for discipline knowledge and said, here's your classroom, go do your thing. And we didn't teach them how to be part of the family. And I think that, um, so I actually believe that the shortcomings of faculty are our own fault on the administration. Um, and so I think it's high time we started fixing it. So it's a great question. I'll give you one tip. Uh, Philly has more to say here than anyone because she's doing the work. But uh, something I started doing from Elon Musk's um, bio, his book, he talks, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but he has the uh, these uh, tenants that he worked by. And one of the first one is put the name by the person who created the policy. And over time, you will find that the person who created the policy is either wanting to change the policy or they no longer work there. And so you end up following all these policies and all these structures and people are no longer there anymore. And the easiest way to get that change is to go, somebody created this. They're, they're gone for nine years. Why are we still following it? And I've been doing that lately and it's been making a big difference. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great question on, on how we do this. I think it, it really is um, requires really understanding the dynamics inside your own institution. I mean, the first time, thing I would say is I spend a lot of time with my board, um, really understanding what it is we're trying to do. I'm always really up front and say, we're going to have issues. Here's the questions you're going to receive. And really trying to help them understand where the tensions lie. You know, like we were talking about a different faculty model for a different student audience for a different purpose, you know. Um, so why would that cause some tension? And how does it not disrespect a model that works quite well with a different audience? I put the, um, the faculty senate chair and vice chair on, on the president's council. Um, and so that is improved communication. I say I seldom get blindsided. I, you know, I do get pushback, but I seldom get blindsided. 
And the other thing I would say is um, there, you know, we make, it's to your point, Kate, we make interdisciplinary, people are deep in their disciplines, want to do interdisciplinary work, and we make that hard in higher education. And I think if we could improve the lives of faculty who want to do interdisciplinary work, um, it would create a broader appreciation uh, for other work, institutional work that is similarly situated. And um, so we're trying to fix some of those issues. And then the last thing is making sort of heroes out of those that are breaking the model and coming forward. And you know, we do a lot of showcasing our innovators, um, investing in them. We don't invest in a new department when somebody's doing something really well. We invest in a new initiative, give it a couple of years to, to run, um, take, take those faculty out to present uh, in different settings other than academe. You know, so real intentional work around showcasing, cultivating leadership among the faculty that are gonna bring a different perspective, so. Thank you for the question, that was a great question. Thank you. At WGU we have uh, a saying that's um, WGU, uh, we're in the tradition of breaking tradition, uh, which I love. Uh, we actually have time for one more question. If anybody has one last question that you want to ask. Hi, uh, Nate Claybury, CAPS Network. So we're a high school program, so we've got students that are coming through. And I had a provost tell me once that they worry about our program because students are coming out more ready for where they're going and not going to college to do that. Mm -hmm. So when you look at how are you, how are across the board, how are you with um, your institutions better preparing your students for their purpose uh, and looking at how do you keep them on those campuses to make sure they come through and then they go on to do that? Well, I love your program. I know the program. Is it uh, in Kansas City, your base? We're everywhere now. I know you are. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, where you started. The park, yeah. Right, yeah. And a uh, big fan of your CEO. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I take a page out of your book, which is let them experience and put into practice what they're passionate about, um, not just read it in the books and learn the theory behind it. And that's where I think the passion, I actually think that's where the agility comes over a lifetime, because we can't predict how disciplines are going to change. So we have to give them the ability to practice and path for themselves and a love of learning, which comes out of following your passion, right? So, I mean, to me, it's about uh, creating places for experimentation, places for experiencing, integrating it with work, supporting their entrepreneurship, um, a, lot of, a lot of active learning design that is, um, that is needed, I think, in education. I would just add, you seen. I don't know if you've seen the regs that are going to come out soon, the financial responsibility regs where schools and universities are going to have to justify basically the ROI on all their programs. And it's going to be, it's a big deal for nonprofit higher ed in particular because those, those levels of regulation were very typical in a for-profit and very atypical in a nonprofit. So you have to reimagine how you communicate value of a program. But Dr. Janet Spriggs right here, she knew I was going to call her out. She works at Forsyth Tech in North Carolina. I mean, that's what, when you think about partnerships, community, the business saying, this is what we need. If you can't deliver this training, we won't hire this person, right? And I think that that's forced universities in terms of responsiveness to, to move frictionless. I mean, you know what I, what I said originally. Except we're not designed to do that, right? We're designed to stop you. Think about the GPA. <laughs> Maybe for undergrads, okay. GPA matters, right? Try to tell a student, let's say an adult student, uh, that a 2.7 GPA when they go back to their master's 10 years later is, has any relevance. I'm, of course, talking about myself. 2.7 was probably a stretch, and I had racquetball and yoga in there at the end to really help get that GPA up. Uh, but but you know what? I went. You go back to school. You, you have purpose at that point, and but the structures are designed to point you in certain directions because you may not be relevant, and you do the, you, you may not be good enough, and so higher ed has to change the way it positions itself. That's our problem. Is we're we're bad at marketing. We're not. We're bad at saying this is the value. We can train you for this. And this and we'll change the curriculum if you tell us it's not that you know this advisory committees and business committees are really important. I think that's what make community colleges really responsive right now in public uh, public colleges to be able to bring in the employer and say how do we create this pathway? 
Because if student doesn't see it, that's hard to justify the ROI. If you can't justify the ROI, then you have to have a disclaimer at the end of it that says, student can't make this much money in this program. And you don't want to have that be the baseline for your, for your marketing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Please help me. Well, uh, thank you, our panelists, and thank you, audience, for great questions. Thank you.